Okay, take two. Here we are, Petra Kucha Lemington, Spark 2022 Ignite Takeover. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It's going to be the ultimate test of the PK format with us all having a big belly full of delicious Indian food. <laughs> if we're asleep, then we know that PK has failed us, but I really don't think it will with this amazing lineup. So if you weren't here for the first session, just a very brief introduction about what Petra Kucha is. Um, it's a format for presenting. Each speaker is limited to 20 slides and they will change every 20 seconds out of their control. Um, so 400 seconds is all that they have to, to get their message across. Um, and based on the ones that we had earlier today, it's sure to be um, a great session. Um, so, as I said, there's a fantastic lineup this afternoon, five talks, ranging from audio production to art curation to peak our curiosity. So, without further ado, allow me to introduce Lindsay Chambers. So, Lindsay is a textile designer and prop maker for television and always curious about learning and making. She particularly loves creating grassroots initiatives involving communities in making and creativity. Um, yeah, just before I start, I just want to introduce Emily that's at the front as well. This project was co founded three of us that co-founded this, and with all good projects, it started with three academics that had at least three glasses of wine in their bloodstream to promote an amazing conversation about what creativity is all about. Um, uh, you can make the judge at the end of whether actually alcohol in the bloodstream does make for a good idea, but we obviously think it does. So, oh, is it... Space bar. There you go. Okay, so uh, this project is inspired by the Brooklyn Sketchbook Project. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. So it's a f over a 40,000 repository of sketchbooks housed in New York. And we wanted to do a very pared down sort of version of that for the City of Culture. So we wanted to disseminate 2,021 sketchbooks across the war all wards of Coventry. Coventry is an incredibly multicultural city and we feel as though the drawing and storytelling is a common language. So there are 120 languages spoken in Coventry and we felt that bringing people together through drawing and allowing people to share their differences was going to be a very big part of the city of culture. The project was always going to be about outreach, about doing workshops, doing activity-led learning, going into schools, going into libraries. That sense of togetherness and community is something that we felt very strongly about, um, and for a university to go out and do that outreach. In the summer of 2020, we did Godiva. We spent quite a lot of money, and we saw over 2,000 people. We monoprinted, stamped, stenciled, and really raised the profile of the project to get families and people from special interest groups kind of really, really engaged in the project. Um, it was exhausting. I think we did it for two days straight. We tried to create a circular economy, that in the sense of organic marketing, that you know we had funding but it wasn't a lot. So whatever we got back with the sketchbooks and the drawing and the content, we put it straight back out. We did the VC's dinner, we went into libraries, we did pop-up shows, and by that then advertising and then handing out more sketchbooks. It was also about making people think a little bit differently about drawing, about how to record their thoughts, their stories, getting people out of their comfort zones. This I worked with uh, arty folks over in Coventry, making them think a little bit more abstractly about how to record and draw. It doesn't have to be observational. And that was incredibly rewarding for us. As sketchbooks started to come back in, in, it was amazing. This is a sketchbook of a guy who was being tested for autism, and his sketchbook was a story about how he felt alone, how he processed things differently, and he was learning to understand himself through the process. So very amazing personal stories came through kind of this initiative. Then COVID hit and we stumbled. Everything we did was outreach and, and bringing people together, so we had to think differently, like lots of other art movements. 
so we had to go online, we did live streaming, we put kind of uh, projects on, uh, things on YouTube to try and get people thinking about how to develop their creativity um, in different ways. So we were only ever one step ahead of anybody else, which lots of people probably felt during that time. We worked with care leavers, we worked with foster kids, we put this on the Coventry website page, so it was a resource for everybody to use. And there's a real momentum then starting to become, because people realised they had more time, everybody was turning to creativity. So whilst we stumbled, we then started to pick momentum up quite a lot. And what's happened is we've got an amazing resource, like never before. We have caught COVID in the Coventry Sketchbook Net. We've got an extraordinary range of, of imagery of people documenting how they process COVID and how they dealt and how their lives were. And it was quite extraordinary to see these windows. We had students that took this project on that couldn't come over to us, and they were, they were in China. So we had people that had never been to Coventry doing this project. So they had to, they had to, it's like affirmations and kind of projecting themselves to Coventry. And they were sending postcards to themselves to understand what it was going to be like when they came to Coventry and our Instagram page started to blossom we've got loads of followers so the other thing is kind of this window into people's view of developing that sort of uncertainty of how people are feeling what the world's going to be like so kind of those sketchbooks came a vehicle of understanding and processing covid so some of it did feel quite oppressive a little bit dark but then equally as we came in and out there was real appreciation there's real joy um there was real beauty in the work that was happening um, and me and Emily felt incredibly privileged actually to have these windows into all these different stories that were happening around Coventry. Um, and obviously now we're out out, as I'm calling it. Um, Emily is the most famous Coventry sketchbook pusher uh, in Coventry. She's impressing kind of um, all these places that we follow on Instagram, so Dashing Blades, you know, some of the sort of places at Fargo. And people that are doing city of culture projects, we've asked them to take a sketchbook to record their project as well. So we're getting out, out. This was the first exhibition that we could have in 2021 at Fargo. 33 pieces of work, 66 sketchbooks, all for people to see, and lots of activity-led learning. And that meant that we could then kind of resell the idea. Sorry, I'll just be aggressive by hitting the tool. Um, it means that we could get more sketchbooks out as, uh, as well. Um, some lovely work, and diversity is really the key in this project. We've got a gender-neutral Godiva on the left, and we've got somebody doing a lovely Matisse kind of collage of the waterways around Coventry so people's approaches have been really exciting to see um, and everyone is so completely different because it was about their Coventry and their story rather than actually producing you know what's considered observational drawing we've got an amazing sort of collateral here uh, 32 pages of sketchbook, 2021 sketchbooks. We're looking at over 65 individual or unique pieces of work when they're all back in. So we've worked with Ben Kineswood in the Coventry Digital Project and he is scanning those in for us and we're going to gift them to the Herbert Art Gallery. It's amazing from observational architectural drawing to characterisation, uh, photo manipulation, photos, and everything in between as uh, we've got in those sketchbooks. Um, and the talent that is hidden in Coventry, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to start exposing and showing people what we've got. This is a call to action. We've still got sketchbooks to hand out, and we're looking for collaborators to help us exhibit this work more fully, to sort of sell the story. This is not just a city of culture project. This is a cultural strategy project now, and it will have quite a long tail moving forward so we're hoping uh, through the process of today we might be able to meet some people and this is a short film 30 seconds not 20 sorry everybody sorry Sarah um, and it just shows some of the quality of work from young kids to adult special interest group and it's this is the Covid edition really of the stuff that's kind of gone on and it's just amazing to see the different styles the type of work and all of it's okay all of it's inclusive and it's just a way of celebrating this extraordinary journey that we've gone on um, over the last 18 months so that's it and thank you for your time Boom. that was a uh, bit emotional actually for me I don't know if it was for anyone else but I feel like I definitely need to go out and get a sketchbook now and put everything into it um, and yeah I'd love to did you say they're going to the Herbert so uh, yes yeah, so we're hoping in a, in a period of time when we get a big ball back in we will gift them to, um, to the Herbert so it's a resource so we don't only do 
own the copyright, we own the sketchbooks, which we will gift back to the city. So it's a resource for everybody is how we want it to be. Yeah, that will be amazing to see one day when we can bear to look back on the past couple of years. Um, so next up, we have Steve Taylor. Steve Taylor, come on down. So, St <laughs> Steve is a recovering muso, in his own words, um, who still spends far too much time worrying about the music that people should be listening to. For the last decade and a half, he has somehow held down a proper job in higher education. His words, not mine, let me just stress. But scratch below the surface and there are the remnants of a rebellious attitude cultivated in 1990s alternative radio that he has never quite grown out of. Steve, take it away. Oh, to script or not to script, this has been the problem. So... And when I press this button, that's when it starts flying through. So I'm going to use the first bit of the, you know, just as, a, as an excuse to kind of do a little bit of an intro. Um, so what follows really is 400 seconds, uh, where I'll sort of riff, I guess, around a theme of independence, alternativeness, uh, oppositional, uh, creative media, if you like, and examples, as we go along the way, of my own involvement, my observations, um, and, you know, with the... Uh, if you like, seeing and watching and observing and being part of this kind of spirit of independence that I think exists uh, within the creative arts and also within higher education, how these things may come together with pictures, essentially. Right, here goes. Whistle stop. So the story starts up the road on the parade in Levington Spa where I worked at Our Price. Vodafone, as it is now, I believe. Um, this is where I was introduced to the fact that I had been a goth but really, when I got to the actual uh, record store, I realised there was lots and lots of music there, um, and that uh, independent spirit was not just one thing. Um, within a few years, I'd got my first break into radio. I worked for a station called Radio Harmony. It was a community radio station. That was my first record I played on the air, Massive Attack. That's Suresh Joshi with Ringo Starr. Suresh set up the station, a community station, which was bilingual. So that was opposition, it was alternative, it was a different way of doing things, really quite unique. Um, then I experienced my first corporate buyout, Harmony became Kix96, um, there's me again. Um, Graham Torrington was the programme controller there, he's still on the air I think, somewhere around. Um, he taught me that um, you, you, there actually was a professionalism to radio, you had to kind of structure stuff and speak in the right way and name the station every now and again, that kind of thing. Um, which was great, because then I went there. Uh, that was down in London. Um, it was a station called XFM. Um, XFM had been a Reading Festival station for a number of years. It got the licence and went on air the day that Princess Diana died. Now, of course, the whole of the radio industry in the UK shut down when Radio Diana died. XFM carried on and started the, the, uh, the station with the MC5 kick out the jams, mother lover. Um, there's the playlist. Yeah, that was the playlist for the first week that I started at XFM. A fair old mix from Puff Daddy, when he was still Puff Daddy, not P. Diddy, um, through to Asian Dub Foundation, Spiritualised, who were just down the road, of course, in rugby. Um, that's me, sitting next to this fella in the middle, and Gary Crowley. Um, so I was part of the music um, committee, music playlist committee. Um, uh, the, the way in which Ricky worked was uh, his job title was head of speech. He meant he was my producer during the day, so he would come in and try and put me off when the microphone was open. That was essentially what his job was. Um, it didn't last forever. Uh, we got bought out. Again, more corporate takeovers, this time by Capital Radio. This is Richard Park down the bottom. Boo. He was on... Fame Academy. Um, he, uh, Capital, bought the station, moved us down to, uh, to, to Leicester Square. That record over there, Never Get Ahead, I made that my record of the week, the week we left. And it was, uh, you're never going to get ahead giving head to the man. <laughs> There's the Capital Radio building that they moved us down to. Um, there was a lots and lots of... I mean, we, we moved into a kind of very corporate, playlisted uh, way of doing things, which was not great, but we knew there was a campaign going on behind the scenes. And the radio authority eventually relented and, and said to Capital Radio, do XFM properly. Um, this was the show that I was eventually given. Um, the A to X of alternative music went out on a Saturday night, five till eight. I used to do shows during the week as well, but that was my favourite show because I could do what I wanted. Um, that was, I used to kind of do a letter each week. So there's my J's that was in Mojo. I did a book, um, and the book was kind of linked to the radio show. Um, and what I did in there is I kind of took uh, a whole bunch of artists from Bob Dylan, 
up to the present day, 2004 at that point, and I talked about how to have an independent alternative spirit, what you needed to do um, was to, uh, uh, to, to control uh, the mechanism by which your music came out, uh, that was the most important thing. I did a book as well that was kind of really academic, well I didn't do a book, I did a chapter, I'm claiming too much now, um, so chapter four, down at the bottom, I am what I play, the radio DJ as cultural arbiter and negotiator, don't know what that means anymore. Um, but if you read it, you won't find it. Um, it sort of talks about how radio um, can be oppositional, can be alternative, and can be corporate at the same time. And how do you balance the two? Then I started working for real in academic world. There's Ealing Studios. Um, I worked at what was called Thames Valley University, became the University of West London. Uh, somewhere in that building there, there was a radio station. Uh, so we set that up for the students to use. It was called Blast FM. Um, and uh, what we did there is that the students did a radio course, but we said... OK, learn how to do radio properly, then go and do Blast FM, do whatever you want. Bend the rules, break the rules, those kind of things. Um, when I got to Northampton University, we set up another radio station. Uh, this time we called it NNBC. Uh, and again, it was working with communities, so I kind of brought that community um, uh, experience back to play. Two groups of um, happy students, bottom corner there, they're the radio students from Northampton, NNBC. Um, this was the popular music course. Um, they put together a rock choir, and that's them photographed outside a church in Northampton where they'd just done Mozart's Requiem, uh, but in the style of Metallica. It was fantastic, yeah? Um, Northampton, we used to bring guests in, so all those posters there was all the people that were coming in for one particular week. Um, this guy down at the bottom, Northampton legend, but nobody knows who he is, Alan Moore. He's the guy who wrote The Watchmen, he wrote Vs for, uh, the, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, all made into films. He hates the fact they were made into films. We got him in for a conference called Trans States, where he looked at uh, things like um, neo-paganism. Um, Jar Wobble, down there, he was a, a legendary bassist with Pill. We got an honorary for him at Northampton. Um, and there's Bill Drummond. Bill Drummond was the KLF. Uh, the KLF were a, a, a kind of a really agit pop kind of rave band who burnt a million pounds quite famously. You know, independent spirit. Uh, then I came here. So I got here in 2017. Um, I'd always been living in Leamington, so I knew what was going on, but I didn't really know what was going on with Silicon Spa. Wow, you scratch below the surface in Leamington, you've got all these games companies going on. They're all hidden behind these buildings and doors. It's absolutely amazing. Um, we, um, I got together with uh, my colleague, Mike Acosta, who uh, runs the games course, uh, and we put together an interactive futures conference with Warwick District Council and a lot of the companies. Where we, we put a conference on at the college, and the Spa Centre held uh, a set of events it's now run, I think, for three years, Interactive Futures, really celebrating the games industry uh, in Leamington Spa. And there it is, happening. Um, what I find amazing, I think, about the, uh, the games industry in Leamington is it reminds me of the music industry way back when I started. It was indies and it was corporates and they were working together and the indies were inspiring the corporates and then taking that out globally around the world. Um, that's where Leamington's sitting. It's got all these creatives doing amazing things behind doors and then sending out across the world. There's Mike that I've just mentioned. There's Steve Stops. He's a games legend in the, in the town. And there's um, Amber, one of our students, who at Interactive Futures talked on a panel called Women and Games. Really important topic. She's now left us, gone out into the sector, and she's now doing her independent thing, transforming the games industry and getting the message out around the world. Stop. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Well done. It's over now. It's over. And I have to confess, I'm fangirling slightly because I have your book. Really? Yeah. Yeah. On my bookshelf at home, the A to X of alternative music. That's me. Um, so next, Vishalakshi Roy is nosy by nature and likes hanging out with creative people. So she's in the right place. She has worked in the creative and cultural sector for the last 18 years as a consultant, business mentor, and academic. But when she grows up, she would like to be a detective. So here is her talk all about the police. <laughs> Hello. Um, I am quite short, so there we go. Right. Thank you very much, and, and what a great bunch of uh, presentations. I've, I'm feeling a bit nervous about following, following that, but I'll be brave and I'll press the, the space bar. Here we go. 
Hi there, I'm Vishal Akshi Roy, and today I'm going to talk to you about identity, but probably not in the way you and I think about it usually. I want to talk to you about how we see ourselves, and more specifically, how creative individuals uh, see themselves as they start a new venture or become entrepreneurs. Uh, as the introduction said, I'm nosy, I like hanging out with creative people, I'm entrepreneurial, and I try and sort of dig around other people who want to do that. Um, so I'm quite excited to tell you about things that I've been uh, doing where I followed 15 creative individuals for about two and a half years, um, and I kind of asked them lots of questions. Um, so basically my presentation today uh, looks at how creatives or artists look at themselves um, or their own identities as they make that journey between being a creative to a creative entrepreneur. So when I say creative, I mean artists, photographers, dancers, musicians, craftspeople. I did not discriminate at all. Um, I really did not want to limit myself to any sort of subsector as such. I just wanted to see that, that journey. Um, and you'll see quite a few people on, on these slides, uh, some very low res Im images. Apologies for that. Um, but basically, I wanted to see how they kind of change as they, as they made that movement. Um, so in the very initial phases, we found that um, they saw uh, starting a business as some sort of um, getting a sense of self-worth or legitimacy as they started to make sort of regular financial uh, transactions using, using creative skills. Um, and a lot of them were not just negotiating their identity as creative people, um, becoming business owners, but there was lots of other roles that they had to kind of fit around it. So being employees, some were teachers, you know, siblings, parents, and they were trying to find a balance between all of those things that was going on um, in their lives. And the term entrepreneur itself was actually quite contentious. I got a lot of pushback. Um, who are you calling an entrepreneur? And you know, as we kind of went along, there was pushback saying, uh, I don't think I'm an artist, you know, who are you calling an artist? And those shifts were really, really interesting um, to look at. And what was interesting is how they started to make sort of these small shifts. So, you know, you and I would think it was like the big things, isn't it? Winning a big contract or kind of, you know, losing a lot of business or things like that that made those shifts. But actually, it was like simple, mundane things that was helping them kind of cement their, um, their identity. And I've got a few examples, you know, being asked to do stuff for free or somebody in their family challenging them about their business or, you know, falling out with a friend all of these things were helping them kind of cement that identity of being a creative person who had just um, started a business. And as you know, some of these um, business owners sort of progressed in their business, they started to see that their, how they worked had changed. You know, so some of this was out of necessity and some of it was because of some kind of personal choice. They were kind of formalizing how they were working. Um, and being seen as a business person and, dare I say, entrepreneur, was also marked with some sense of loss. Um, you know, loss of creative integrity. I mean, one of my favorite quotes was, um, buying paint used to be a hobby, but now it's a business expense. Um, so there was a sense of loss that was going on as well, which was really interesting to study. Um, and even those that were being wildly sort of commercially successful felt that they needed to be more artistic or do more artistic activities to feel, um, you know, they needed to kind of hold on to that identity of being a creative or an artist. So that was, that was also very interesting for me. Um, and what they saw as success was not always what other people outside saw as success. I mean, there were some who were making a fair bit of money, but, you know, this was tinged with sadness. Equally, there were some that were quite happy that they commercially they weren't, you know, things weren't taking off really quickly, which sounds really weird, but there seems to be some kind of joy in the fact that this was taking some time to kind of, you know, get off the ground. So as any good researcher would do, I tried to put all of that together and build some models and, you know, things like that. I ha also had to get a PhD out of this, so, you know, I had to do things like that. Um, and I found that there were two clear pathways of what I called identity journeys. Um, 
commercially expedient and altruistic. So commercially expedient were the people who basically were kind of highlighting the fact that they were distancing themselves from being artists and creatives, basically. Um, and the altruistic people were the ones who were you know, looking at all these other things that they were creating, jobs for other creatives or being role models for other people. So these kind of things were what was giving them, you know, helping them, what I would say, achieve identity equilibrium or kind of make their peace, if you may. So if you see the first quote, I'm not an artist, and the second one, oh, I just dance, you know, I don't really run a business, do I, really? So those were those two kind of things that were going on in, in people. I also found out a bunch of other stuff, but this is probably six minutes, so we'll save this one for, an, uh, for another day. Um, but yeah, I mean, the main things that, that, you know, that I'd probably like to kind of conclude is um, peer, pe creative people make shifts in their identity when they become entrepreneurs. Um, how they do it or how they make their peace is actually quite different. And commercial success is not all, the only definition of success for them. But I'm guessing that comes as no surprise uh, to this crowd. So if there's anyone in this room who's kind of thinking about making, you know, taking that journey into creative business or, you know, wants to talk about the trials and tribulations, you know, come and, come and buy me a drink, meet me at the bar, and I can share my own experiences of starting a business. Um, yeah, so, you know, feel free to, feel free to, to, um, to take that forward or just come and have a chat because I'm nosy, so I'd like to quite find out, find out more. Um, and that's pretty much all I have today. I hope that you found that interesting and, and you also think that's worth spending four years of your life doing um, because, you know, unfortunately that's gone. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, so Outgrowing really started with a number of works we had in the collection by local artists, which you can currently see on the screen now. Um, so these include people like Elizabeth Whitehead, Emily Ledbrook and Florence Engelback. Now you'll be excused for not knowing who any of them are. Um, I didn't before I came to Leamington. Whilst um, Elizabeth Whitehead's name might be familiar to Leamington residents, um, none of these artists have particularly strong name recognition, um, nor did they gain kind of great fame throughout their lives. Um, furthermore, very little is known about the lives of these women. Um, but these works, particularly those by Elizabeth Whitehead, are really indicative of a great artistic talent and skill. But without much biographical information about the lives of these women, I was a bit worried that they would only ever really be seen as attractive decorative objects. Um, so I really wanted to tease out the artists behind these works, and I thought the best way to do that would be to explore more widely the reasons why women have painted or made art with the subject of flowers. And so that is really how Outgrowing was born. That, uh, this is an amazing book, which I will just come into, into a se in, come onto into a se in a second. Sorry about that. Um, so female artists have long been associated with flowers. Um, societal restrictions and beliefs often meant that uh, they were limited to this subject matter. Um, professional and intellectual pursuits, including the arts and the sciences, were considered to be beyond the understanding of most women and irrelevant to their domestic role. And thus, uh, women were also denied access to full arts education in Britain, at least until the second half of the 19th century. Uh, the study of flowers, however, both artistically and scientifically, was considered appropriate for women and even beneficial. Um, at least to upper class women. Uh, the study of flowers was believed to help develop a woman's natural affinity for the decorative and was a suitable accomplishment that made a woman a better prospect for marriage. So that's nice. Um, furthermore, it was a supposedly non-threatening subject matter because uh, it could be studied on an amateur level at home and didn't involve you going out and meeting any unsuitable men. Um, while societal restrictions, particularly around the arts, relaxed over time, um, we can still see evidence of these restrictions in the works of the local artists we saw at the beginning, by, like Ledbrook and Whitehead, painting at the turn of the 20th century. The subject of flowers was in some ways a safe choice for unmarried women like Whitehead, teaching other women, including Ledbrook, and requiring minimal resources. But whilst we wanted to explore the complex ways in which women were limited in the arts and sciences, more importantly, we wanted to show how many female artists had triumphed despite these restrictions, creating an uplifting exhibition for our visitors. So we've got four themes within the show, uh, each of which show the difficulties women have faced historically, but also their great achievements. So the four themes are flowers as a suitable subject for women in art, the rich area of craft and design which many female artists developed, the botanical feats which many female artists undertook, and also why modern artists have continued to be drawn to the subject of flowers despite the widening subject matter available to them. So this thematic framework has allowed us to find connections between works from wildly different time periods. Um, so a personal favourite of mine has been undoubtedly the botanical illustrations of Maria Sibylla Merian and Margaret Mee. Both of these women undertook perilous journeys to South America, breaking with many of the social mores of the time to pursue their scientific passions. So Merian travelled as a middle-aged divorced woman to the colony of Dutch Suriname, which is now just Suriname, in the 17th century to shine a light on the phenomenon of metamorphosis amongst insects and to depict the plants that they lived on. Whilst Mee travelled across the Amazon rainforest pretty much on her own with a pistol, um, as an early ecological pioneer documenting the deforestation um, of the Amazon rainforest in the second half of the 20th century. Um, much of the work undertaken by female artists has been overlooked historically, often due to the subject matter. Even great scientists like Sibylla Merian were forgotten in the 19th century as botany became an increasingly male-dominated field. 
Examples of fine craft and design, embroidery and tapestry, for example, which often boast floral motifs, have been dismissed as women's work and not seriously seen as art until recently. Even in the modern age, the traditional subject of flowers associated with the feminine could be considered to have held some artists back, like the pioneering modern British artist, Winifred Nicholson. Oh gosh, I'm really going so slow, aren't I? This is terrible. Um, whose floral subject matter was not seen as radical enough as a vehicle for modern ideas. I timed this at home and everything. Anyway, I'm almost at the end, I promise. Um, so throughout our exhibition program, we've really tried to find ways to re-examine works in our collection, presenting them in new ways, and we've been really grateful to a number of amazing galleries like the Courtauld and the Royal Academy and Kew Gardens, who have lent some wonderful works to us, which have helped show our own works in a new light. And I really hope that you'll be able to come down and see it for yourselves. It's open until the 24th of April, every day except Monday, so be there or, you know, don't support feminism and flowers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane. She's doing my job very well for me there. Selling, selling the gallery. Definitely come down and take a look at that. Lots to see. And that brings our Petra Kucha Spark takeover to an end. I hope you've had um, a great time listening to all these amazing talks um, from our speakers. Huge thanks to everyone who's come up here and uh, pressed the space bar and entered into the unknown. Um, it really takes such a long time to be so concise the preparation that goes into that, Sarah said in the um, session at the beginning, the first session in the beginning, um, that you know, to be there's some quote that I'm misquoting, but to be concise is actually incredibly hard and takes a very very long time. Um, so yeah, that's it. I think the bars open upstairs. Please um, go and have a drink and talk to each other and um, enjoy these closing moments of Spark 2022. Thank you for coming. Thank you.